So I hope everybody can see how to foster a love of reading. And that's that's I'm 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 so interested in the benefits of extensive reading, but I think as teachers, we don't want to sort of teach so hard that we wind up teaching English, but leading students to dislike reading, right? That would not be a great outcome. So that's why I want to talk about how to teach English, but at the same time, teach students to love reading at the same time. So just to be clear, I mean, I think there are broadly speaking, two types of reading. There's intensive reading and extensive reading. There's the kind of stuff that you do in the classroom with reading skills, skimming and scanning and vocabulary from context and all that stuff, which I, I do think is, is hugely important. It's just not what I'm gonna talk about today. Today, we're talking about extensive reading, which just as we, you know, when you work with speaking, there's a time when you work with pronunciation and accuracy, and there's a time when you work with fluency and just speaking. There's a time in reading where you're working with fluency, and that's where extensive reading comes into play. So that's that's what we're talking about today, not just my presentation, but really all, all of the presentations that, that we have today. Not to say that intensive reading is unimportant, it's just that extensive reading is what we're focusing on today. I, I think a lot of us who become English teachers are what I would call natural readers. We love reading. We read from the time we were children. It's what we do for, for fun or for leisure or for relaxation. And I think it's important for us to remember that of those people who are natural readers, we're the minority. But those people who are natural readers are the people who become teachers. They're also the people who become writers. They're the people who become editors and publishers. And so you can get this sort of small world of, of people who love reading, who are maybe 20% of the population. And yet our students encompass people who might not be natural readers. So I am also a parent. I have I have one child. And as I watched him grow up, when he hit school age, kindergarten, first grade, age five, age six, there was a point at which I realized my son is not a reader. He can read, there's nothing wrong with his literacy skills, but he's not someone who loves reading. And I had to ask myself, not as a teacher, but, but as a parent, can I accept my child for who he is? Can I accept him as someone who is a wonderful person, but who is not naturally a reader? And my answer to myself was, no, no, I can't. I don't think I can live with this very wonderful person for 18 years if he is not naturally a reader. And so I thought, what can I do about this kid to turn him from not a reader into a reader? And so from the time he was about five until the time he left high school at, at 18, we went out every Sunday for breakfast because he loved breakfast, like you know, restaurants in general, he liked breakfast. And I took him reading. We would go out for breakfast, order some nice food. I would have a book. I'd give him a book and I would read. And, you know, there were some weeks or even some months when he wouldn't do very well. He'd sort of sleep or flop on the, you know, the, the, the seat and not pay attention. But after a while, he would pick up the book and he would read. And the end result was he became a reader. And I'm not I'm not telling this story to say that you need to take all of your students out to breakfast once a week. I understand that's not possible. But I'm saying that even if somebody is quote unquote born not a reader, they can change. You can change someone who isn't a reader into a reader. And that's so hugely important for academic success because reading is everything. 
reading is your key into science, into history, into math. If, if students aren't good readers, it's hard for them to be good at anything. And I think a lot of my son's academic success came from his learning to become a reader. So from a teacher's point of view, from an English teacher's point of view, there are all kinds of wonderful reasons for our students to read. Obviously it helps their vocabulary, it helps their collocations, it helps their grammar, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at this list I have up here, the only thing that has a question mark where it says improves speaking, that's not because I don't think it's true. Research has shown that students who are extensive readers are actually better at pronunciation and speaking. The question mark is there because we don't really know why. Why would reading silently make you better at pronunciation? So we can't explain it, but research says that it's true. So those are all those teacher reasons that we would want students to become strong, extensive readers. I would say if you as a teacher understand those reasons, that last point there is, for heaven's sakes, let the students know why you're helping them become good readers, that, that they will achieve all these benefits. But if you step back and think from a student's point of view, what is the point of reading? I think students are going to broadly be reading for either information or entertainment. They either are going to learn something or they're going to enjoy something. And this is not by any means an exhaustive list. I mean, information could be information about absolutely anything, right? History, politics, sports, hobbies, you know, any kind of information. And anything that is a story, science fiction, romance, horror, history, include down to information. So when, when teachers tell me, you know, my students aren't interested in reading, I step back and I think, well, are they interested in any of these things? And I think you, I, I, um, unless you're a student suffering from some sort of severe depression or, or cognitive disability, you will be interested in something here. So if you as a teacher can help students see where reading is their entrance into something they enjoy or something they want to learn about, that's your key to motivation. So for students who don't like reading or who are resistant to reading or don't enjoy it or fight you on it, what can you do? So in today's presentation, I wanna talk about three different areas. I'm saying you can either present the act of reading differently. You can sell it to them in some different way. You can use different material. Perhaps they're reading the wrong books, uh, wrong subject matter or wrong level or something. Or perhaps your way of assessing them is, is not working for you. So I, well, let's go back to, to each of those, those three different readings, uh, three different areas, sorry. So one way of presenting reading, obviously, is to hand students a book and say, read. But that's not all there is. You can certainly read aloud. I've, I've had very strong experiences as, as a child, having my parents read to me. My parents read to me as a young child, but they read to me up through late junior high school. My father read myself and my brother the entire Lord of the Rings series which is long, when I was a junior high school student. Obviously, at that age, I could read it for myself. But the act of having it read to me was, was so wonderful. I listened. I hung on every word. I felt emotionally bonded to my father. It was, it was very powerful. So even if your students are adults, you can read aloud to them. You can have an audio book read aloud to them. Uh, audiobook, mo most graded readers from, from publishers are available with audio files. You can have students listen, listen while they read, listen without reading, and it's another way into the world of, of reading. You can offer your students time to read in class, time to read outside of class. I think if you're 
aware of how much homework time your students have for not only your class, but other classes, and you take that into account and you make your assignments manageable, if they don't have class time or they don't have time outside of class, you know, a, a, adjust the schedule so that it's possible for them to read without feeling overwhelmed. Often what chokes students up, I think, is, is the way in which you grade or you assign credits. I know in Japan, it, it has become very popular in some classes for people to count pages read or numbers of books read or minutes read. If that works for you, and I think that does work for a kind of student who's very, I want to say gamified, who's who's into sort of points and levels and, and leveling up like that, that's wonderful. But there are also students who, who are resistant to that or who see a system of minutes counted or pages read as, as kind of the sort of game that you would cheat at, and they look for ways to make the pages read turn up without actually having read the pages. If you have that kind of student, then look for another way to count things. Look for numbers of book reports or quality of book reports or something else. But I've, I, I've, I've put at the bottom, if one system isn't working for you, try another system. So if whatever you're doing to get students to read or to encourage them to read, is somehow encouraging students to cheat or making them feel discouraged, then let that system go and try some other sort of system. And we'll, we'll talk pretty soon about other ways to assess and to give credit and to check ways that students read that we'll come back to, to this idea. If students are not happy reading or reading successfully, it could be the type of readings that you're giving them. So when you're when you're thinking of choosing materials for students, I think you have sort of two, two huge divisions. You can go with every student reads the same book or you allow students to choose different books. Neither system is better or worse. It just depends on how you teach and on your class. If students are all reading the same book, then you as a teacher can give them uh, discussion topics and things to do together in class. You can ask them to have read up to chapter X by this date and to come in and, and do something with that. You can give projects or worksheets knowing that they've read the same material. And that can be very kind of useful from a, a, a teacher point of view. If you have students who are all reading different books, that helps with students who are interested in different things. I've mostly taught um, junior high, high school, and university level students and adults. And for me, it's been much easier to let students and readers choose their own material. There will be huge differences in what they're interested in from fiction versus nonfiction. There are students who like to read books where they understand almost everything. There are students who like to read books that they find challenging. If you look at the extensive reading literature, I think there's sort of a, 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 a push to saying that you need to have a certain amount of, of vocabulary be understandable, and it's pushing you to read books that are a little bit below your level so that you're not stopping to check a dictionary and whatnot. But you know, these days, especially if you're reading an ebook or you're reading on your phone, there's a word you don't know, you just tap it and, and, and the definition is there for you. So there are people who are happy reading books where there's a lot of unfamiliar vocabulary because the story itself is motivating to them. I actually just got back last week from two weeks of studying French in France. I'm a pretty fluent French speaker, but I, I went there to, you know, level up and my conversation was weak. And while I was there, I wanted to read a book at night to unwind. And I I actually chose a, a like a young adult book that <laughs> I thought the, the ideas would not be very hard for my brain. The language was still hard. And there were a lot of words I didn't know. 
And I just didn't care. I just skipped over them. And I know from a, a classic extensive reading point of view that there was too much unknown vocabulary for me. But for me, I didn't care. As long as the story was interesting, I let all those words go. I did not look a single one up. I was often reading in the bath. I'm not going to look for a dictionary. Other students might feel frustrated by, by a high level of unknown words, and they will do better with reading slightly below the level of words that they know. But because students are all individuals in your class, if you have a variety of books and a variety of opportunities, you can cater to all kinds of students. And for those who are more motivated by plot and interest and don't care about vocabulary, let them go. And for those who are going to feel insecure or frustrated if they don't understand every word, let them read a level or two below them. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, the the, the um, presentation right before mine by Leslie Ito on setting up a school library, if you have not already watched that, all these are recorded, go back and watch that because she's got some, some great tips on how to set up a library that will have a bunch of different materials so you can find things that will be suitable for your students. When I first began writing and also publishing graded readers, because I do both, I was a little bit hesitant around the idea of, of classics. And I, I, I understand why people adapt classics and publish classics. It's because it's legal to do so, right? They're, they're public domain stories and there's no copyright issues. And I thought, oh, I bet students are more interested in something original and something new and something contemporary. And what I found was that, particularly from, from some countries, the students were fascinated by the classics because they have, you know, a, a cultural meaning. And if, if you know those stories, then you can take part in conversations. You understand references. You're, you're, you're part of the conversation. So I, if I were setting up a large library for my own classroom, I would have a selection of classics and also contemporary books. So students could choose among those. These days, you have a choice between paper books and eBooks. I think some teachers, just because we are older, are more used to reading on paper. And I, I, I hear a lot of teachers and older people saying things like, I, I prefer real books. So an ebook is the same story. It's still a real book. It's just accessible in a different format. If you have students who are who who don't have a lot of time at home or in a physical environment and find it hard to find time to read a book, but might have 20 minutes on the train or a half hour bus ride somewhere, so they could easily access an ebook on their phone. If you can make books available in more than one format, then you can hit more than one lifestyle. What you want to do with books is to make them more accessible and easier, right? And not less accessible. So to the extent you can, I would say, open up your idea of what is a library to include paperback books and eBooks and audiobooks. So when let's come to assessment. I I have encountered when I've observed classes and talked to teachers uh, situations where students have loved reading, but what they haven't loved is the book report or the assessment piece of it, whether that's a, a quiz or a project or something. If you want students to learn to love to read, then when they finish reading, what they should not encounter is some kind of punishment. If when they finish reading, they can encounter some kind of reward, how much more empowering would that be? So if the way in which you give credit for reading is making students not love reading, think about what you can do to assess reading differently. Any kind of assessment 
reading or, or, or otherwise, the number one thing you want to do is to see if the assignment was fulfilled. If I want students to read a book, but I want to check with my assessment is that they read the book. That's, that's really 90% of it. If I've asked them to have had a thought or trace a character or thought about vocabulary or something, then I want some way of checking those elements as well. But I don't want to ask them to read for pleasure and then give them assignment and then mark that written assignment down because they've spelled some words wrong or gotten some grammar tenses wrong. I wasn't teaching grammar tenses. I wasn't teaching spelling. So if, if, if students feel that they, they read a book and they love the book, but when they try to, to talk about that, they're going to lose precious points because their verb tenses aren't good, <laughs> you, you, you've got a conflict there between your goal and, and the way you're getting at it. I also think, especially with reading, that's about ideas, but also emotions and, and, and feelings that you want to give students room to express themselves and to express the interaction they had with the book. I, I, I see textbooks sometimes that will, will ask students to explain why they liked a book or assignments that say, talk about why you liked the book. And students don't always like a book. It's possible to read a story and dislike it. And they've had just as valid an experience with that book as, as someone who liked a book. I read books sometimes and I don't like them. It doesn't mean I'm a bad reader. It means I, I didn't like that book. So I don't think you want to require students to like something or make them feel that they have to give a response that what's the teacher's looking for. Let them respond genuinely and authentically to what they read. I'm, I'm very sensitive to the time it takes to read book reports and to grade stuff and whatnot. If you can let go of a system of points, of giving them 87 points for this, but minus two points for that, and grade more holistically, I, you can certainly grade with a system of, of A, B, C, D, F. I tend to grade book reports with a, a check, a check, my, a check, a minus, or a zero. Did you do it? That's a check. Did you not do it? That's a zero. Did you do something really amazing? Okay, that's a check plus or a plus. But mostly I just wanna know, did you do it or did you not do it? But I also give you my, my, my last suggestion there, the idea of calling it extra credit. There are certain classes who will do anything for extra credit. Even if you felt that reading were a required part of your course, what if you called all of your book reports extra credit? If you read a book and you demonstrated some sort of interaction or understanding of it, you got five points of extra credit that was added onto your test scores or your, your wherever it is you add extra credit. I bet 100% of your students would be lining up to do extra credit. And in particular, your weaker students who are doing poorly in your class would be doing more extra credit and doing more reading just because you've called it extra credit. And in doing more reading and more book reports and whatnot, they would actually raise their overall level of English. But again, I'm gonna come back to choose the system that works for you. If whatever grading system you have is not making students love reading, and it's not making you love interacting with your students as reading, then, then try something else. So the, the purposes of any kind of assessment piece for the teacher and for the student are a little bit different. You wanna know that they, that they did the assignment and that they learned something and you'd like to know what they learned. For students, they should be able to put into words what they learned and to demonstrate what they learned. And as a nice secondary piece, they can 
be working on, you know, practicing their writing or practicing their speaking, depending on how you have them deliver their, their book report. So if we could move from an idea of book reports into more book reviews, so that it's, it's less about the student's level of English and more about the book itself, if you put a focus more on the book and on the reading, I think you'll get students more engaged. So as I, I've said before, if, if the assignment itself is more difficult or more odious than the reading, you can have students who love reading, but they dread getting to the point where they have to do something with it, whether that's pass a quiz or write a paper or something. So you don't want the final checking piece to be unpleasant, right? So I would give students examples of real life book reviews. And there are book reviews all over YouTube, all over TikTok, all over Instagram. I mean, there, there, there are whole channels of what they call book talkers on, on, on TikTok. Um, there are whole, any, any book you look up on, on amazon.com has reviews on it. So show them examples of, of real life book reviews that people write because they're motivated, not because they're in class. And then talk about what is a good review? What, what, what helps other readers, right? Should you give the ending of the story? Uh, how much of, of your personal reaction should you bring in? How much of the book should you bring in? Show them and examples of good book reviews and discuss them. But I, what I think is super important is to give students a choice between different formats because different students will have different feelings about different book report formats. And what I want them to do is to choose something easy and pleasant. So these are some of the questions that I ask. I don't ask all of these questions in any assignment. I, I, I pick and choose among them, or I might say from this list, choose three questions or choose two questions or choose four questions. But if you look at these questions, it's nothing is about you know grammar or your, your English ability. It's about how did you feel about the book? What did you expect before you read it? And were you surprised? Did anything about the book not match your expectations? How did you handle new vocabulary? Did you look it up? Did you not look it up? There's no wrong answer. It's just me interested in what you did with vocabulary. Would you recommend this to someone? Would you not recommend this to someone? But where I, I think you can make the biggest difference is in offering students a choice of format. Even when I had university students, I would give them a choice of format. And I would say, I want you to read, you know, one or two books per semester. You need to do a book report. It's due on this date, but you can choose. You can do an oral report. You can do a written report. You can do a report in some other format I, I don't care if students do an interpretive dance as, as long as they have reacted somehow to the content of the book. And if they're, if they're free to, to give their own interpretation in a way that's not oppressive, they will be more enthusiastic about reading. So here's an example of a one sentence book report. I'm going to give you just a moment to read that and, and ask if you can tell what book this is, because it's a, it, it's a pretty famous book. And that is a, a, a real life book report by Rick Polito, who's done a number of these. So you can, if you Google his name, you can find other books, book reports, if you want um, by him. That's The Wizard of Oz. Right. It's 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 sort of a humorous take of, of of the Wizard of Oz, but it's a one sentence summary of the whole book. That is a little bit humorous. What if you asked your class to each read a book and give a one sentence summary that was a little bit humorous? It wouldn't take them too much time, but it would be an enjoyable assignment. So if you want 
more ideas and more resources for bringing extensive reading and books to your students. Um, there is ER Central that has materials for both teachers and students. There's also the um, AmericanEnglishState.gov that has free graded readers that has classics that are adapted. They're available as eBooks. They're available as PDFs. Uh, I think some of them have audio. They're completely legal to download and share with your classes. There's this wonderful platform, xreading.com, that has collected graded readers from all of the major publishers. They have quizzes. They have a, a, a way to... to track how many books have been read, how many words have been read, so you as a teacher can see what your students are doing. There's a new uh, graded reader app that is free for students. At the moment, only on, on um, Android, but I, 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 I keep emailing them and say, bring out the iPhone, bring out the iPhone, and I, I, I think they are developing that as well. That again, has graded readers from, from all the major publishers that and is available free for your students. The re readable doesn't have any kind of quizzes or, or whatnot, but they can save any vocabulary words that they want to a list and, and study them again. Um, the publisher that, <laughs> the pub, it's me. The web address of my graded reader page. We do have one a lower intermediate book that is permanently free on a variety of platforms as, as an ebook, if your students or you would like to try it out, uh, which is the Bee Creek Blues. It's, it's on Amazon, it's on Apple, it's on Kobo, it's you know available in a number of different places. And if you have turned up for today's seminar on, on graded readers, I also have a free ebook for you. This is one, it's it's a classic, it's an O. Henry short story and it is one that I adapted. And there are discussion questions, there are post reading resources and whatnot. If you go to that web address and put in that coupon code, good until, ha <laughs> look at that, May, June 30th. It's June 30th. So until, we, we have a month for that, but until June 30th, 2023, then the book will be absolutely free. It is normally a dollar. You're not saving a huge amount of money, but here you have a free ebook. You are welcome to use that with your classes. You are welcome to give it to students and, and see how it works. Um, so feel, feel free to share that and to use that with your students. And I think, yeah, yeah, sorry, we never, I, I never have time for questions because, because, because I'm a talker, but Reading is, is, is so useful and so helpful for your students. If you can get them engaged in reading, it will help their speaking, it will help their writing, it will help their pronunciation, it will help their grammar and their vocabulary and, and everything else. It's, 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 it's sort of the, the key to everything. But as you bring them to reading, you don't want to bring them to dislike reading. You want to bring them to love reading, right? That's that's the whole point. So I've I've looked over the the presentations that are available today. I know it's a long day of a lot of information, but if you're registered, you get the recording. If you don't have time to listen to everything in one day, do save everything and come back and and listen to things when you do have time because everybody has a slightly different angle of how to approach reading and how to get your students involved. And I think it's just, it's so important and so useful. And I will stop here. Thank you so much for, for, for listening and for considering reading.